Tom Sutholt with Classic 107.3. Kevin Putz has an enviable track record for a composer. When he was young, they applied to him all of the usual promotional blandishments. Hot, young, promising composer, up-and-coming composer. Well, Kevin Putz obliterated that terminology pretty quick, especially when he received a Pulitzer Prize in 2012 for his very first opera ever, and that was Silent Night. And it has been one thing after the other, seemingly in all genres of, of classical music. He was born 48 years ago in St. Louis, Missouri. But uh, when he was 10, he and his family moved to Michigan and was raised there, which means you don't know what high school he went to. Ha! And since then, it's been uh, tours with uh, every conceivable uh, performing artist who means something on today's landscape. Uh, not to mention, of course, uh, after growing up in Alma, Michigan, he went to the Eastman School of Music and Yale University, earning a Doctor of Musical Arts degree from the Eastman School of Music. Uh, here's a list of his teachers. It's pretty impressive. Samuel Adler, Jacob Druckmann, David Lang, Christopher Rouse, Joseph Schwantner, Martin Bresnik, uh, and in piano, Nelita True. It's quite, quite a list of a who's who there. He also studied at the Tanglewood Music Festival with William Bolkin and Bernard Rands, composer in residence with the Fort Worth Symphony, and uh, he has done works for seemingly everybody, and we'll get into that. Uh, everything from uh, works for Yo-Yo Ma, a uh, percussion a concerto with uh, Evelyn Glennie, and the list goes on. Kevin Putz is here at the Classic 107.3 studios, and the nice thing about it is, I mentioned when he was a young man, well, he's not old yet because this has all happened pretty quickly. And Kevin Putz, uh, welcome to Classic 107.3. Good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's very much a pleasure to have you here, and thanks for taking uh, the time. What is more awkward, to uh, endeavor to write a first opera or to receive a Pulitzer Prize for it thereafter? <laughs> <sighs> well, I mean, it was uh, not something I expected to... Um... To, to, to win the Pulitzer Prize. Um, actually, writing the opera was um, s surprisingly uh, not awkward. It was, it was really a pleasure. Um, and it's kind of refreshing because it was a new, a new avenue for me. Um, I had uh, made my career um, writing for orchestra and chamber music, as my teachers did, as all of those, those amazing uh, people you mentioned. Um, and I didn't really think think of writing opera. I mean, it wasn't something that was talked about, you know, at school. Um, none of my teachers were really doing it. They may have had an opera that they did some at some point, but it wasn't, you know, necessarily performed. And I, so I aspired to um, work for, to write for orchestras and um, to be commissioned by orchestras. And um, so I, and I loved the orchestra, you know, that was another, um, it was easy for me to want to do that because um, there's just nothing like it, you know, the power and the, 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 the variety that's possible, the sonic variety that's possible from the orchestra. But um, there was also, um, I think, you know, an important part of my music, which was a narrative element, um, which had been developing through the symphonies I was writing and concertos and longer pieces. And so maybe in those pieces you can hear an imaginary story going on, um, and so when I started writing Silent Night, where I had an actual story and a libretto with structure and a clear um, sequence of scenes, one moving to the next, it was just a dream, actually. And it was really compelling for me um, creatively from the very first note, uh, writing it. And I loved it. And I knew, I thought when I started, and I've said this in many interviews, I feel at this point, but that I just wanted it to go well enough so I could do another one. Um, because I was thinking the opera, you know, wouldn't really be performed um, much. It was so big and expensive, and everybody said, if you're going to write an opera, keep it small. And this was like a massive piece with a big orchestra, a big chorus. So anyway, um, it was it was a it was just a pleasure creatively, uh, and I almost couldn't keep up with myself as I started that opera. Given the narrative proclivities, pretty much like a duck to water, then, is safe to say. 
Yeah, I mean, I guess it felt like that. But you know, the other thing was that, that the libretto by Mark Campbell was just so strong and so um, natural musically, and he knew my music. But there's just something you know, Mark just sort of understands dramatic structure, and this scene needs to be followed by this scene, and you could you could hear music at every moment. It's based on the 2005 film Joyeux Noël, mm-hmm. uh, and this is about the famous uh, so-called impromptu armistice that mm-hmm. occurred mm-hmm. Uh, between soldiers on the the front lines in World War One at Christmas time. Did you look in the mirror after you won the Pulitzer Prize, and 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 did it make you think, oh my gosh, now what? <laughs> or did well, it? Make, there, or, was, or did you look at it as encouragement? Um, yeah, definitely encouragement, yeah. and. Um, you know, it's it's still, um, you know, I, I think my fear was that, yeah, somehow it would change things and I wouldn't be able to, to write music in the same way anymore. Um, that I would feel more um, more exposed or more, more conscious of every decision I was making. Um, but it really didn't change anything. It was interesting that um, I guess before I, before I won the award, I... I felt I felt that I knew who I was as an artist, and I knew what I liked. I knew, you know, no matter what the world had to say about it, um, I I knew my my tastes and my personality as a composer. And um, I found that that had, didn't change, you know, um, after that surreal uh, couple of weeks after <laughs> having won that. It really was a it was a it was just a shock and. Um, but really something that I just feel incredibly fortunate to have to have won. And besides, Verity didn't get a Pulitzer Prize for his first <laughs> opera. So, so there. Yeah. <laughs> not, not, not bad. And of course, uh, you have done more operas uh, since then, uh, including, uh, must be a man after my own heart here, uh, doing an opera on the Manchurian Candidate. What a wonderful idea. A good idea. Um, I I think the piece is in many ways better than Silent Night. Um, there are a few things I'd, I'd like to rework um, at some point. A few, a few of the opening scenes. I think um, it was a it was a challenging piece to write, and I I think I I met it with the same um, kind of polystylistic approach, um, which worked for Silent Night, and I think for a thriller, it's a it's more important to stay more streamlined stylistically and just sort of, um, you know, not be kind of accessing all kinds of different musical vocabularies. And I think maybe if I could rework some of it, I would, I would go back and kind of streamline that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And any chance of that happening in the near future? Oh, I, you know, I've been asked to do it. It's just a matter of finding time because um, I'm doing other projects, and um, it's. But it would be worth doing, I think. And I have to mention uh, the chamber opera mm-hmm. uh, that you have done, Elizabeth Cree, which is based on a novel by Peter Aykroyd mm-hmm. called *The Trial of Elizabeth Cree*. Mm-hmm. Uh, explain the scenario for that for those who are not initiated. Well, that's a that's that's a, that's a kind of whodunit about about this you know this girl, Im- impoverished girl, growing up in in London um, in the late 1800s, and. Uh, rising to fame um, on the music hall stage and becoming a famous performer. Meanwhile, there are some gruesome serial murders going on. And so we're trying to figure out who's committing those. And so it's pretty dark. <laughs> it's, uh, but, but, you know, I, really, it was so fun to write that. And the other thing that was interesting was that for, I think for my first two operas, I had relied on the orchestra to do a lot of the storytelling. And with Elizabeth Cree, I had a very small 15-player orchestra, um, so I was required to think a little differently. Um, you know, you can't rely on the big, rich string sound for all your emotion. You know, you have to <laughs> think of other ways to do that. Um, but it was so oh, – I, I had such a, a blast writing that. And I, I have not seen a performance of it. I've heard music from it. Uh, I, I'd love to see it in the near future. Uh, it's uh, that kind of story, again, uh, very much after my own heart oh, you know, and, and, and the way I lean. Uh, you have four symphonies to your credit. You wrote your first one in 1999, uh, the latest one in uh, 2007. Uh, you've done chamber works. You've done song cycles. Let's see. You've done something for uh, Rene Fleming uh, not too very long ago. Uh, letters from Georgia, mm-hmm. I exp- and talk about that one because that's yeah. letters of Georgia O'Keeffe. Georgia O'Keeffe, and and something that was, um, yeah, just so unpredictable the way your 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 life kind of works out um, creatively. Um, I was commissioned by the Eastman School of Music um, 
who was going to take their orchestra on tour in New York, their student orchestra. Um, so they, they wanted to commission a, a, an alumni composer for an alumni performer, and Renee Fleming was, was also a student at Eastman. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of a dream collaboration, um, and she she was into doing the piece, and we talked about who we might, you know, who might the subject be. And I think Renee, you know, she said, well, you know, if you, you could use some poems and just we could just do a song cycle, but it'd be interesting to, to think of a, a character for me to be. I think Renee really likes to think of herself as, you know, just as like an opera singer. She's, mm-hmm. she's st- very much wants to, re, you know, identify as some character. And we thought of um, an important historical figure who was a woman. And I found some quotes of Georgia O'Keeffe online, which were actually very poetic and um, and beautiful. And then I found that they came from an immense volume of letters that she wrote to her husband Stieglitz um, over the course of their entire relationship. And so I put this kind of libretto together myself, which is something I hadn't done before and really an amazing um, experience. And we got the rights to use these letters for this piece. And then Renee had the idea of expanding it into a piece that included Stieglitz as a baritone. So the two of them, this, having this long-distance relationship, most of the time Stieglitz was in New York right. while um, O'Keefe spent at least half of her year in the Southwest working. So they wrote, sometimes they'd write three letters a day and go to the post office, and then, of course, it took like a week before they were reading what the other person wrote because of the post uh, at the time. But um, now, So that larger version is called The Brightness of Light, and um, and we've... Uh, we hired Wendell Harrington, this amazing um, videographer, uh, sort of projection designer, to make an, an amazing set of projections that goes with it. So that's been going around the country um, to different places. And, but this collaboration with with Renee Fleming um, is just something. Uh, you know, I, she's the kind of person that you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, once you get to know, you know, her voice um, as a composer, she can do things that you just. Uh, only dream of you know hearing your you know hearing in your music. So it's been wonderful. You grew up as mentioned uh, in Michigan. So uh, I, I guess a two pronged question, but both are related. Uh, what was the first music that arrested you, that captured you, and when did you decide that you wanted to become a composer? And what was the circumstance, uh, if any? Well, you know, I th- my parents played me recordings. I remember, like, right here in St. Louis, um, I remember listening to records of Beethoven, Fifth Symphony, and Dvorak. You know, they were not musicians, but they loved music. And uh, I remember going to the store with my dad because the Beethoven's Fifth record broke, and so we he, I had to choose a, choose a replacement, and I would just go in by, you know, that was probably six or something. You know, I was like choosing by the picture on the front, you know, that's all. <laughs> but, I, but I remember it, it just, it, it wasn't something, you know, it wasn't kind of interesting to me. It was like electrifying. You know, Look on the bright side. Look on the bright side. At least it wasn't Scheherazade. <laughs> but, right, true. true. <laughs> that's so. true. That's true. Just a picture of the conductor, I guess. Yeah. Um, but, um, Anyway, so so that music and then and and film music, you know, I went to, I was a huge Star Wars fan. I still am. Um, so you know, we went to those movies that John Williams scored, and you know, the, I just was like, oh my, this is the most incredible sound I've ever heard. And I would go home and try to play it on the piano, and couldn't quite figure it out. And eventually, the recordings would come out, and I'd buy them. So, I would say those composers, you know, like the cinematic. Um, it's a mar- marvel of of John Williams music which I still just love I think he's just the most brilliant composer um and um and you know just these like the standard classical um repertoire that I listened to growing up um on he- with headphones Bach Brandenburg concertos Mozart symphonies Beethoven symphonies um wow. so that's yeah and then I and then I you know I got to know pop music um kind of later through the radio through my friends and um I I get and I I kind of like it. I guess I like it equally. I mean, it all kind of mixes together for me as a composer. Good music is good music. Yeah, right. 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 Exactly. And even if it's three minutes long, if it's well done, if it's crafted well, um, it's just all the same to me. What was some of the non-classical stuff that you liked growing up, the pop music that you were talking about? Oh, geez. I mean, I liked, uh, I mean, Van Halen, uh, you yeah. know, um, I liked... Uh, uh, I, I'm just thinking of like minute work. Uh, <laughs> I'm just thinking of the like when I was like in sixth or seventh grade, the kinds of things I was listening to. Um, I like Chicago. I like these, you know, oh, like, yeah. like lo- slow ballads. Mm-hmm. Um, 
No Tell Lover. And, and, yeah, I mean, you know, Michael if, Jackson, if you, Madonna, you, all that stuff. If You Leave Me Now. If You Leave Me Now, yeah. Oh, great yeah, song yeah. from Chicago. Hard to say I'm sorry, you know. Yeah. Because the harmony is so beautiful and mm-hmm. and much and a lot in many ways more interesting than a lot of um, the, the harmony um, that contemporary uh, pop music, you know, incorporates. It's just like, you know, interest, like Chicago tunes, like unexpected modulations yes. and inversions of harmonies which are not something that are often done now anyway so i i, I love those i still love those I, th- I think they had an impact on my music those songs and i think um it's you can hear it so when did you decide to become a composer uh, was there know, was there a moment or well was it just i mean i had a, I, I always improvised on the piano i always made up music and then i had a teacher um, in michigan when i was maybe 11 or 12 who started encouraging me to try to write some of it down and she helped me write it down um, I think seeing the movie Amadeus, um, when, when was that? 84. 84. I think that had, I, I think that instilled some kind of fascination, you know, in the whole process, like that, that sort of coming from somewhere that you can't really explain. And, um, that movie, I think for a lot of composers, I don't know if they admit it, but I think that <laughs> that had some kind of impact on, on the, the kind of, uh, the the mystery and the magic of of writing music and it may have led to their wanting to do it themselves. Yeah, mm-hmm. there is that scene in Amadeus. I haven't seen it in years, but it's unforgettable. It's where Salieri is reading through the various manuscripts of Mozart, and you hear the music as he reads each differing manuscript, and eventually he becomes overwhelmed, and he drops all of those uh, shards of paper to the floor. And he's in this swoon at the sheer variety of beauty that he's encountered. Yeah, and all those pieces they they chose such amazing excerpts. But 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 I, yeah, what, what's amazing in that scene is like here's this 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 composer who's extremely talented who could look at a score and hear it in his head, yet yeah. that something that Mozart had that he couldn't quite grasp as a composer. Um, I think that's where a lot of the magic of that film. Lies. But I love that scene. I love the scene when he's talking about um, the Grand Partita. You know, mm-hmm. this like this uh, like a yeah. the winds, the basset horns, like yes. playing a rusty like a rusty squeeze box, and then an oboe right. high above as oh. the music's going on. I, it's like I think that was his first encounter with Mozart's music. And um, oh, that scene is and, and F. Murray Abraham was just oh, so incredible, just incredible. Yeah. And you know, some of the best music education material. I've ever encountered. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm not surprised that you would cite oh, Amadeus yeah. as a formative mm-hmm. uh, influence. Here's the big question. On your website, you have access to a YouTube uh, video where you're talking about, uh, you're giving advice to young composers. Uh, how to start off, what style should I write in, what should I do if I want to be a composer? And of course, you give the obvious advice that you know you should be true to yourself. You should be honest uh, You know, in, in all of your musical utterances. Is it ever that simple? Uh, how much of it is your need to express yourself vis-a-vis what the audience might like? Well, I think that the pressure that young composers likely feel is not coming from that as much as, as it's coming from their peers and the and the critical world. You know, once they sort of begin to have performances, um, it can be really tough. You know, to kind of wear your heart on your sleeve, or you know, to write music um, that uh, might be appealing for the audience. But the, the problem is that once if you do that, everyone thinks you're doing it for the audience, and you know, I, you're doing it for yourself. I mean, you can't really predict who the audience is and what they like, and um, all you can really do is follow your own instincts and respond to that music that from the very beginning that really touched you, you know, that, that you just feel overwhelming emotion about. Um, I don't think you can ignore that. I don't think there's any way you can um, turn away from that in your own writing. You know, it has to have some impact. You have to find your way to be yourself and have, and be still have a reflection of of, of that music that you, you loved from the, the time you were a kid. And, and then of course the music that you've learned along the way, um, as you, as you develop, but yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I just feel like there's a lot of fear out there. Um, everyone's afraid to, you know, they're afraid of what, 
uh, people might think or might say or might hear. There's still a lot of that going on, I think, in the in the contemporary music community. I, I think that I'm really an outlier um, in many ways. Um, I think there are a lot, you know, it's a lot of composers don't really get what I'm doing or why I'm doing it or... Um, but for me, it's just it's I'm I'm writing the music that'll be interesting for me to write, you know, that'll keep me writing, and um, um, I just sort of go with the projects that I'm asked to do, and um, I don't really have a a, a real arch plan, you know plan right. as far as like where my career will go or what I'll be writing. I'm it's it's developed in a very organic way and. Um, based on collaborations with people who've responded well to my music and who I think I can do something for. Um, so, yeah. And given the frequency with which you're working, uh, obviously, you know, first and foremost, you need to express yourself and mm -hmm. your individuality. But it must be, at the same time, very nice indeed to have received the acclaim uh, that you have received from so many audiences in various directions. It's gratifying and and, and, and wonderful, and it's... it's um, I just think that the important thing, though, is to um, keep thinking about um, the the music I'm writing and always trying to craft it better um, and um, learn from the mistakes I make, the things that I hear, and things I won't do again. And, you know, I think I feel like I'm still growing, and I always will be. Composer Kevin Putz, his Silent Night Elegy is going to be featured in the upcoming concerts this weekend of the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra in tandem with Beethoven's Symphony No. 9, The Choral. Uh, no pressure on Kevin uh, on that one. Uh, it is a s orchestral suite that is derived from uh, his first opera, which incidentally won the Pulitzer Prize in 2012. Kevin Putz uh, in the classic 107.3 studios to talk about it. And, and uh, Kevin, welcome. And uh, how does it feel to be a, uh, to have a major Symphony Orchestra uh, put your work, your rather recent work, uh, up in tandem with Beethoven's Ninth? Well, I'm probably not going to come out ahead on this one, but, um, you know, it's uh, it's just nice to be... <laughs> I'm glad I'm going first, let's put it that way. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's it's a, it's actually just amazing and kind of surreal to, to think of these performances this week with the St. Louis Symphony. When I was growing up here um, and playing, you know, Clementi and Mozart, or early, you know, little piano pieces on the piano, um, not very well or, uh, you know, in a way that would, you know, I mean, but my grandmother used to say, oh, we have to get, we have to get you to play for Leonard Slatkin. And, ah. um, to get, you know, and of mm -hmm. course it was, would have been ridiculous, you know, but um, at the time, but so the fact that I'm back here as a composer and Stefan Deneuve is, uh, has, has really embraced my music. Um, he's just, uh, I feel like I've met someone who's, who's going to, we're going to have a long-lasting um, uh, artistic friendship. Um, we really understand each other, and uh, I feel very honored that he's uh, taken my music and, and into his his uh, as a repertoire. So, but this piece, um, "Silent Night Elegy," um, after "Silent Night" was premiered, I think it was 2012 or 11. Um, it had been suggested, you know, that I make something out of the orchestral music, um, as Benjamin Britten did with Peter Grimes. You know, he has the four C interludes, which are separate movements. And I couldn't really find a way to do that with this piece. Um, and so what I did instead was to kind of tell the story of the opera in like 23 minutes. Um, so it it's a single single movement, like, a, like an essay. I call it elegy. Um, but it, it kind of tracks the story of the opera. And you chose the word elegy to describe the uh, the whole arc mm -hmm. because there's, I guess, something of a poignancy with the storyline. Sure. I mean, you know, it's, it's um, in, in the story, you know, this unlikely moment um, where the, the troops from the different armies um, on the first Christmas Eve of World War I decided to get out of their trenches and have... A truce and share, you know, champagne and chocolate and and play soccer together. Um, of course, the question of the opera is what happens after that. And um, they were the you know reprimanded by their generals afterwards and sent to horrible places like Verdun or you know, and so it's this, it, it ends in a very it ends in a very um, you know, tragic and and very sad uh, way for sure. And I think I wanted to reflect that in the kind of overall 
nature of the piece. And of course, they were already in a tragic situation to begin mm -hmm. with, the ultimate human tragedy right. yes, uh, in many ways. Mm -hmm. You have not worked with Stefan Denev prior to... Uh, he events? actually, the one time is that, that on his very opening um, concert here in St. Louis, uh, he asked me to write him a, a short piece, which I did. It's called Virile. Uh, based on a Guillaume de Machaut tune, and that was premiered last September, uh, so that was my first time. Wow. You have written for the St. Louis Symphony before, uh, back in 2004, for their anniversary. I think you wrote something for the SLSO and Leonard Slatkin, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was called River's Rush, um, a very virtuosic uh, orchestra piece uh, that he that they they premiered uh, they yeah they premiered mm -hmm. so it's safe to say you made it to leonard slatkin finally that's true actually yes <laughs>